Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Washington Coalition of Sexual Assault Programs webinar on sexualized behaviors among siblings. My name is Logan. I'm the Child Advocacy Specialist here at WICSAP, and have had the pleasure of coordinating this webinar with Carrie Pierce and Lisa Swisher from the Center on Child Abuse and Neglect at the University of Oklahoma. Trainings on pertinent topics such as this are one of the ways in which WICSAP strives to support your work as advocates for sexual assault survivors. For those of you who may be less familiar with the coalition, we are also available to you for any questions or resource needs you may have in your daily work. Before I turn things over to our presenters this morning, I'm just going to cover a few quick logistics. Hopefully everyone's hearing the audio okay through your phone line. Please let us know via the chat box in the left-hand corner if you are having any problems with volume or clarity. We will also be using this chat function for questions and comments throughout the webinar. Carrie and Lisa will be responding to these as we go today, but we'll also try to save a few minutes at the end for any additional questions. You should have received a copy of the presentation slides in your reminder email for today's webinar, as well as several handouts on this topic provided by our presenters. In case you missed that email, those resources will also be attached to a follow-up email that confirms your attendance and training hours for today. Be sure to check your spam folder for that if you don't get it shortly following the webinar. That um, email confirmation will also include your attendance and training hours, so go ahead and keep that for your records for today. The webinar recording and materials will be posted on our website under trainings and events, so please check back in a week or two to access this. If you are sharing a computer with a colleague and either didn't register or didn't log into the webinar using your personal link, if you could please just send me a quick email with your information so we have an accurate number of who's joining us today, and I can also forward you that email confirmation with proof of your training hours. My email is logan, L-O-G-A-N, at wixap.org, and I'll type that into the chat box here for you in a second as well. As always, we would greatly appreciate your taking a few minutes to fill out the evaluation at the conclusion of today's webinar. And we just wanted to let you know that we do have interpreters working with us today for this training, so the presenters may pause intermittently just to give folks time and um, certainly let us know if we are moving too fast. So we are very excited to be able to facilitate this training and share Lisa and Carrie's experience expertise with you today. Um, we worked with them a couple years ago on a webinar related to children with sexual behavior problems, and I am confident that today's training will be just as informative and valuable to your work. So without further delay, I will let you all get started. All right. Thank you, Logan. Mm -hmm. uh, welcome, everybody. We are pleased um, that you are here joining us today, and we thank you for this opportunity uh, for us to talk about something that's uh, very important to us. Um, which is sexual behaviors among siblings. Uh, my name is Lisa Swisher, and I'm a psychologist at the Center on Child Abuse and Neglect at the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. And I've worked um, with adolescents and school age and preschool children um, in varying capacities uh, for about 20 years. And I'm going to let Carrie Pierce introduce herself. Hi, I'm Carrie and, uh, Pierce, and I have worked at the university um, for about 13 years um, in some capacity working with um, children or adolescents with problematic sexual behavior. All right, so first we're going to start off talking about typical sexual behavior. So there is a fair amount of sexual behavior that occurs among children, including siblings, um, and when we're talking about siblings today, we're talking about not only biological siblings, um, but step-siblings and half-siblings, um, as well as foster siblings. Uh, so just like any part of development, cognitive development, social development, motor development, uh, children are developing sexually as well. Um, and this occurs uh, before birth, throughout the lifespan. And so as part of that, there are um, a fair amount of sexual behaviors that occur among children 
that uh, most experts would consider typical. So this would be some type of behavior that involves parts of the body um, which are considered to be private or sexual, um, such as genitals, breasts, or buttocks. And these are normally part of growing up for children. Um, we'll talk about some retrospective research on that in a minute. But most experts would not consider these types of behaviors harmful um, to the parties that are involved in that. Something else that we know about sexual behavior um, that occurs as a part of growing up is that it can be influenced by cultural and social factors. Um, so for example, in some parts of the world, um, it may uh, be common for groups of same gender of all ages to bathe together. Um, here in the United States, that happens less frequently, um, and you know we may consider that um, unusual. Um, so that's one way that it may be influenced by cultural factors. The, these are some guidelines to determine um, when, when the behavior is typical or when it's sexual play versus more problematic sexual behavior. Um, so sexual play tends to be exploratory. So it's motivated by curiosity. Kids are curious. Say, for example, um, you know, a little girl may notice that her brother uses the bathroom differently. And so she may be curious about why that is um, and may examine her brother to figure out why he's different and what makes him different. Sexual play is spontaneous. There's not a lot of forethought involved. There's no planning involved. It's just something that, that happens. Uh, sexual play is intermittent, so it's something that siblings or other children may engage in um, when they play together, but it's not something that they're going to always do when they play together. It's not always going to be a part of their play. Um, it occurs intermittently. When there is sexual play, it, it occurs by agreement of all the people that are involved in the play. Everybody agrees to it. Nobody feels bad or uncomfortable or these strong emotions of anger, fear, or anxiety. Another thing that we know about sexual play is that it tends to occur with children of um, similar size and cognitive and um, age and development. Um, so usually when it's sexual play among siblings, they tend to be close in age. Another thing about sexual play is that it occurs across childhood. So we hear about it probably more frequently in preschool children, um, and that's because preschool children uh, don't have the cognitive development usually to be able to conceal their play. So it's more often discovered in preschool children, um, but it does occur across um, the, the childhood lifespan. Um, when school-age children are involved in sexual play, typically they know that there are some rules about that, and so they'll work to conceal their play. Sexual play tends to occur with children that they know and play with already. So this may include their siblings. It is also likely to include children of the same gender or sex, since those are typically who they're playing with. What we know about long-term um, implications of sex play um, is based on a few studies of college-age children where they were um, given some surveys and some questionnaires to answer questions about their sexual play as children. So we know that it's fairly common, 60, about 66% to 80% of those college respondents reported in being involved in some type of sexual play when they were children. Most of them reported that their parents did not know and were never aware of the sexual behavior. A lot of times the um, sexual play occurred with children that were the same gender, and they reported that it, there was not, it was not related at all to their adult sexual orientation, whether they played with same-sex children or opposite-sex children. If um, it was categorized as true sex play, so the children were about the same age, there wasn't any force or aggression accompanied with the sex play, then most of the participants viewed that as either a positive experience for them or as a neutral experience. So they weren't reporting any strong negative emotions to that. However, with siblings, there were some inconsistent results 
um, with that. It wasn't um, as easily categorized, and I'll talk about that in just a minute in another slide. Um, what we know about the sibling relationship is that um, historically and culturally it's viewed uh, to be the most important and uh, enduring relationship in the family. Um, so most people value their relationships that they have with their siblings very highly. Another thing that we know is that if there's going to be intrafamilial, intrafamilial sexual abuse or sexual experiences, it's more likely to occur among siblings. Unfortunately, it's the least reported and the least, re least investigated of intrafamilial sexual experiences. So there's not a lot of research available. I'll um, talk about what we do know, though. So retrospectively, again, with those college-age samples, they were able to determine that, again, it wasn't a, an uncommon experience um, for siblings to engage in some type of sexual play or sexual experience with each other. Um, it involved all ages of children, from yet very young children through adolescence. And it was more difficult um, with this type of the, the research that was conducted to categorize it as sexual play versus problematic or more abusive type sexual experiences. What was known is that females, and typically younger females or younger sisters, uh, felt more vulnerable and felt that the sexual relationship or sexual behavior that they had had um, with their siblings um, tended to be felt that it was more exploitive. Um, than how males viewed their sexual experiences with siblings. Most reported that their adult sexual adjustment was not affected in any way, either negatively or positively, by what um, experts would consider typical sexual experiences um, when, when their sibling was near their same age. Now I'm going to switch to more um, how do we determine whether it's a sexual behavior problem versus that typical sexual play. Um, so one thing that we can use to determine if it's a problematic sexual behavior is research. So there's um, a, a wonderful instrument um, called the Children's Sexual Behavior Inventory, and they were able to norm and so Dr. Friedrich that did this research was able to norm children between the ages of 2 through 12 um, based on their age and gender of sexual um, behaviors that they engaged in. So there are some behaviors that were rare for all ages of children, and that would include um, more type, types of sexual behaviors such as oral sex or inserting something into the um, anal or the rectum or the vaginal area. Those were considered rare sexual behaviors for all ages of children. So that's one way to determine whether it's problematic. Another way would be to, to look at how often the behavior is occurring and how long the behavior persists. Um, so any time that it occurs um, with greater frequency than would de be developmentally expected um, or continues despite appropriate parental intervention, um, that would be a clue that it's problematic sexual behavior. Anytime there's coercion or aggression involved, so threats, um, so that, you know, if a brother says to a sister, for example, if you don't do this behavior with me, then I'm going to tell mom um, that you stole money from her purse or something like that. That would be considered coercion. Um, anytime there's anybody is hurt physically from the sexual behavior, that is also a problematic sexual behavior. Another way to look at it also is that the behavior might not only be harmful physically, but harmful either emotionally or socially as well. Um, and so one example of this may be um, a, a little girl that we had several years ago in treatment who was about eight years old and had a lot of self-touch behavior. Um, and she did this behavior um, at home and at school and in her dance class. Um, and so it was socially harmful to her because at age eight, other kids knew that that was not something that would, was okay, and so they rejected her. Um, and so that's another thing that you should be looking at, too, is in what ways it can be harmful. Um, Any time that there's, it's accompanied by strong fear, negative emotions, or anxiety for any of the participants involved, that has crossed the line to problematic sexual behavior. 
And then another thing to look at is when the sexual behavior occurs among children who are very different um, in age or their cognitive or developmental abilities, that would be um, problematic. Um, we had a child several years ago who was referred who um, was 12 years old um, and he, had, he was, had some severe autism and he was engaging in sexual behaviors with his much younger siblings um, who were six and seven at the time. He was showing his private parts frequently to them, but he was functioning more at a five-year-old level. So for him, we handled it as more of a typical sexual behavior, um, talking with the mom about some of these ways that we'll talk about in a minute, um, about how do you, what are parental responses to typical sexual behavior. So that's another factor that needs to be considered. We're going to talk a little bit about the effects of um, having problematic sexual behavior, um, a child with problematic sexual behavior in the family on the other children in the home and on the family as a whole. And so sometimes what can happen is um, they, you have co-occurring behaviors or emotional problems. So you may have kids that have a problematic sexual behavior, but they also have some other type of emotional problem or behavior problem. They may have, um, many times we see kids with problematic sexual behavior, they make, they have a tendency to make really poor decisions or they're very impulsive. And so you want to look at, um, they make um, impulsive decisions around all their behaviors, not just their um, sexual behavior. There's also, if there's multiple kids in the home, there's an increased risk for victimization, um, not only on the other siblings in the home, but on the child that has an in, that has the problematic sexual behavior. They tend to, again, be really impulsive. They um, don't have good boundaries for themselves, and so they're more at risk for being victimized as well as other kids in the home. Um, there's increased caregiver stress. They have to, um, this is not something we can go to a PTO meeting and talk about my kid has problematic sexual behavior and he and he has problems touching his sister or his brother. Um, so there's very few people the caregiver can talk to and have a support network around this. Um, and so they're feeling very isolated. They're feeling very stressed. They're feeling very guilty. Um, they could be feeling anger also. But they're also, in many cases, having to provide extra supervision. And if you have caregivers that um, have to work more than one job or they have or it's a single parent or you have numerous kids um, it's going to be hard to provide that supervision and make sure that eyes are on those kids at all times so it's very important that the caregiver has some sort of support system to help them um, with this um, there's also an increased risk of placement disruption so if they children had to be removed from the home due to problematic sexual behavior, then what happens is um, if they're placed in a different um, home and the, the provider or the caretaker for that home isn't aware of their need for increased supervision, they may act out again sexually because they don't have the proper intervention or supervision um, needed so that they, they um, decrease their problematic sexual behavior. They also may have social problems. You're, um, you can't have kids over to spend the night as frequently, um, sometimes not at all because you have concerns about uh, problematic sexual behavior. So it's not only um, not having sleepovers for the child with problematic sexual behavior, but potentially for the siblings as well. Poor peer relationships, if this behavior is happening at school or like Lisa mentioned, um, one girl had some problematic sexual behavior in her dance class. Kids might make fun of um, this child or they might, um, if it gets out at school that they touched a younger sibling, their people will make fun of them or criticize them pretty um, highly um, at school. They also potentially have a decrease in school performance. Um, sometimes this is because they um, aren't allowed in the school um, because the behavior happens at school. Sometimes there's um, not the support they need to have, uh, get the support they need at school. So school sometimes will um, tell kids they can't come to school at all, so they get lack of support um, 
at the schools, and so they're being um, homeschooled. Um, in Oklahoma, sometimes homeschool provided by the school means two hours in a library once a week. So you want to make sure, so that's going to decrease a kid's school performance, particularly if the parent doesn't have the resources to provide extra education at home outside that two hours once a week in the school. Um, the effects of problematic sexual behavior on the other child. Lisa discussed this a little bit. There is very limited research. We do know that kids who have been uh, that have been sexually abused may sometimes um, have trauma or need further treatment, but some kids don't um, need further treatment. They just need a good support system, they need good supervision, and they need a stable um, home while others need treatment. And um, the reason, and there's very little research to determine when that happens. It, it can depend on the use of coercion and aggression in the abuse. It can also depend on age difference between the kids. It can depend on the severity and frequency of the abuse, um, support from caregivers. So a kid may um, have much a harder time dealing with sibling sexual abuse if the caregiver is not supportive or doesn't believe them that it happened. So you want to make sure that um, when you have a, a case with kids with problematic sexual behavior, that the other child is screened for potential um, harm to them. But if, if the child is reporting that they have no anxiety or they have no fear of the, other, of the sibling with problematic sexual behavior, that very well may be true. So just be aware that not every kid that has sibling sexual abuse needs treatment, although they should be screened. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit, and so common effects of sexual abuse on children, the most commonly documented symptoms are fearfulness, um, a diagnosis of PTSD, which is anxiety, withdrawal from um, friends and family, um, that high level of that flight or, flight or fight um, that kids have, an increase um, of acting out, Um, so an increase of acting out behaviors, maybe an increase of fighting, an increase of hitting. Um, there's also going to be um, there's also going to be a likely not a likelihood. There's also an increased risk for inappropriate sexual behavior. So the child who was the victim may have an increased risk for sexual behavior. Um, not all kids who have been sexually abused will act out sexually, but they are at an increased risk. So just kind of be aware that not all kids who act out sexually have been sexually abused either. Um, many times we think that kids who have been, who act out sexually have been abused and that's not accurate. Um, while some kids have, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that they have been abused. When we talk about those kids that have an increased um, risk of acting out um, as a result of um, problematic sexual behavior, we want to make sure, I want to talk just briefly about differential diagnosis because many times kids who act out, one of the um, symptoms for PTSD is high anxiety. And when you have high anxiety, children sometimes demonstrate this with um, they get real fidgety, their um, homework or their schoolwork may suffer, so their progress, their performance in school may decrease because they're, and they can't keep in attention, they withdraw. Many of these signs and symptoms um, are similar or mimic ADHD. And so sometimes what happens is parents or the schools may not recognize that the child is having, suffering high anxiety and the, they may say, oh, well, this kid has ADHD because they're not paying attention in school, they are easily distracted, their schools, they did have A's and B's and now they are having C's and D's. We need to get this kid tested for um, ADHD. And then they may put them on medication and then the medic, and when that doesn't work because it's not ADHD, it's, it's high anxiety, 
They may give them more medicine, which would then cause them to be even more disruptive in class. And then when they have highs and lows of the medication, then you sometimes get even further misdiagnosis. So just kind of being aware of it could be ADHD or it could be symptoms um, for PTSD. And let's take some time and really figure out what's going on with this kid. Is it truly ADHD or are these a result of if this kid's had trauma in the past, um, if this kid's had trauma in the past, maybe this is some anxiety related to that trauma. And so sibling sexual abuse can sometimes be very traumatic for kids. Also, another common symptom is problematic sexual behavior. So the other kid may start exhibiting poor boundaries. They may um, exhibit um, and mimic some sexual behavior that they've seen. So just kind of being aware of that. Sometimes, um, so oftentimes kids who have been exposed to trauma are, may benefit from therapy. And when they can, and some kids don't need therapy, we've discussed that, but there are some kids who really might benefit from therapy as a result of sibling sexual abuse. And so when signs you want to look for, when you may want to help or talk to a parent about, you know, it might be good if you seek some additional help just to get this checked out, if they have frequent physical complaints, frequent complaints about stomach aches, they've been taken to the medical to their pediatrician, and the pediatrician says there's nothing physically wrong with this child. Maybe that's a sign that they are having some sort of trauma um, related to sibling sexual abuse. If they have frequent headaches, and again they've been taken to the doctor and physically everything's fine, but they continue to have headaches, that may be a sign that the caregiver needs to seek. Um, therapy or or different kind of help. If they if their irritability and moodiness changes, so if they have an increased irritability or if they have changes in their mood, if they were once a happy-go-lucky kid and they were always talkative and they had lots of friends and then all of a sudden they're really depressed, they're withdrawn, they don't want to talk to the family, they don't want to eat dinner with the family, they don't want to go and enjoy things they used to enjoy in the past. That's a sign that maybe they need to seek treatment or some other mental health service. Um, very angry and aggressive outbursts that are out of the norm for the kid. Crying episodes for no reason. Continuous nightmares and difficulty sleeping. Sometimes kids just have nightmares, but monitoring that. How many times do they have nightmares? What are they, um, what are they dreaming about or having nightmares about? Why don't they want to go to sleep? Changes in eating patterns, and that could be not eating or an increased eating, um, zoning out and daydreaming, those are all signs that the child that the child um, that is the uh, victim may need to get um, treatment for um, sibling sexual abuse. Some other things that we've talked about already are withdrawal from peers and activities they once enjoyed. So if they really like dance class and now they don't want to go to dance class, they just want to sit at home and um, watch TV, that may be something that we need to check out with a mental health professional. If they have fear or anxiety about what happened, um, it's pretty normal for kids not to want to talk about bad things that happened to them. That's pretty normal. Um, so they may not say, I'm really scared and about what happened to me, but they may have a lot of fears and anxieties that they didn't have before. So if the um, sibling sexual abuse, let's say, happened outside in a treehouse and they love to sit outside in the treehouse and read books, but now they no longer want to go in the treehouse because it's scary, that might, be, um, a, uh, that might be a way for you to notice that they have high anxiety or fear about what happened. So they may not want to talk about the event, but where it happened is somewhere that they may have a lot of fear and anxiety about, anxiety about for no reason. Um, a report from teachers for an increase in disruptive behaviors, dropping of grades like we talked about, zoning out in class. Again, sometimes teachers um, misdiagnose or consider referring them for ADHD. So just kind of monitoring that and making sure everybody's aware that um, trauma has happened. Deliberately hurting themselves, refusing to go to school, drug or alcohol use is um, a risky behavior that sometimes kids um, engage in when something traumatic has happened to them. 
they'll start talking about death, they'll start reading about death, maybe they have an increased interest in stories about suicide, they also potentially have inappropriate sexual behavior. So those are things um, that you want to be aware of and uh, when they can benefit from treatment. So when you're an advocate for families and you're working with families and you're encouraging um, families to seek treatment, while you may not be giving the treatment yourself, you want to be an advocate for these families and help them determine what are good services um, for their family. What's an appropriate service look like? Because you, when you're advocating for the families, you want to make sure your families get the highest quality service that they have. So while these therapies are um, to be uh, administered by a licensed professional that's experienced with this work, you as the advocate for these families are going to say, you know, this is a quality professional that I know does really good work because they are, um, they have a no lot of knowledge about trauma and these are the type of therapies that they are skilled in administering. So you know that you're advocating for your families to have quality care. Um, one of the best known um, treatments for kids who've experienced trauma is trauma-focused um, cognitive behavior therapy shortened to TSCBT. Um, this actually originated from work in the military when our veterans and Army um, men and women came back from service, they found that they suffered a lot of um, symptoms as a result of being away. And so they've developed trauma-focused CBT and what that, and so we have now used and adapted this with children and families who have suffered trauma and it's been very, very successful. It's actually the therapy that is most recommended for kids who experience trauma. The really nice thing about it is it averages 12 to 18 sessions. So most kids do not need to be in treatment for years and years and years. It can be done um, in an hour to an hour and a half sessions every week um, for those 12 to 18 weeks. Each session is divided into individual um, child and parent sessions, and the length of each session may vary depending on the topic of the day. But um, the parent's going to know what the goals of the treatment are, what skills the child is learning. The kids should be getting the kids and parents should be getting homework every week so they can practice those relaxation skills. Um, there should be the same therapist for both the child and the parent, so everybody knows what's going on. There's also going to be combined parent-child time in most of the sessions so that the kids and the parents both can practice the same skills and they'll know what everybody's working on and what um, interventions they're putting into the home. The components of TSCBT are psychoeducation, so they get education about um, sibling sexual abuse, what, and they... Um, also to discuss stress management techniques. There's going to be direct exploration of the trauma. Um, it's oftentimes referred to as a trauma narrative. And this is really important that while the kids don't want to talk about it and we don't encourage people who aren't trained to, to constantly talk about the event with the kid, the therapist is going to be trained in having the kid tell their story. Because what adults think may be bothering the kid may in actuality not be bothering the kid at all. It may be some point of the event that's really harmful, I mean, that the kid focuses on. Um, and so it's really important for the kid to tell the story and talk about what, what did they perceive to be the scariest part. They're going to um, explore, explore inaccurate attribution. So what this could mean is it's my fault that I told on my brother or my sister, and that's why he had to move away. Um, so what they're going to do is talk about that's pretty inaccurate. The reason your brother had to move away or your sister is your brother or sister made a bad decision. So let's talk about what you can do um, and how this isn't your fault. And, again, always, 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 um, if a kid has experienced trauma, the parent should be involved in the treatment, and that's crucial um, because the parent needs to have the skills um, to how to handle um, behaviors in the home when um, they're not in therapy. Sometimes kids don't need full diagnosis for PTSD, which is the most common diagnosis for kids who have experienced trauma, but they still have behaviors where they're acting out. Um, they may have increased aggressiveness like we've talked about. They also may have um, 
just very impulsive and making poor decisions, but they don't meet, again, that full treatment for PTSD. And so another um, therapy that's been um, highly recommended for kids who have experienced trauma, but their behaviors tend to be more um, aggressiveness and impulsive, and they don't meet that full diagnosis, is parent-child interaction therapy. It's, again, evidence-based. It was developed by Sheila Eiberg out of the University of Florida, and it combines a lot of elements of attachment and learning theories, um, behavior modification. It really is a, a behavior parent training model. It involves direct coaching of the parent with the kids. They really learn how to interact and give better commands um, to their kids, and they learn how to praise and how to give adequate consequences and rewards to their kids in a more constructive manner. Um, again, it's very short term. It averages 14 to 16 weeks. Um, they will have weekly sessions from about an hour to an hour and a half. So again, somebody that um, is tra very well trained in parent-child interaction therapy is also a good referral source. The website for PCIT, are, I just wanted to provide you with that information. There's also a website for the University of Oklahoma and their PCIT work if you're interested in more information on PCIT. So just some conclusions about um, the retrospective research done on siblings and abuse of problematic sexual behavior. Some research um, suggests that the effect of sibling sexual abuse um, is could be very harmful. Um, and so the same known effects that we know that children experience when the perpetrator may be the father or the stepfather or the uncle or some other um, adult in the home, they can experience the same kind of effects when it's a sibling. Also know that some sibling sexual abuse um, does not have ill effects on kids. And so just monitoring and making sure you keep close contact with kids and families is important. Um, Typical things that siblings might experience are anxiety, depression, PTSD, and substance abuse. We're going to turn it back to, over to Lisa to talk about uh, um, a little bit more in depth about sibling sexual abuse and types of behaviors that may be more harmful. So this next slide um, is a, uh, a chart or a kind of a conceptual continuum um, that was developed uh, here uh, with our colleague, Dr. Mark Chaffin. Um, so these are factors to consider, um, say, when you get a phone call from a caregiver or a child welfare worker about a sibling sexual uh, behavior experience. So the, the factors that you may that you should look at to determine whether it was expected sexual play versus problematic sexual behavior, um, and most sibling sexual behavior are, are going to fall into those two categories, either that typical expected sexual play or problematic sexual behavior. Rarely, um, it does cross the line to what would be considered more abusive sexual behavior. Um, but again, these are some factors to look at. So for example, um, coercion. That is, there's never gonna be coercion in expected sexual play. Rarely it occurs in problematic sexual behavior, um, but it's very typical in abusive sexual behavior. Again, another factor to consider would be um, associated emotions. So looking at the children who were involved in the sexual behavior, um, if it was sex play, Again, there may be some uh, emotion associated. Maybe they're a little bit embarrassed that it got discovered, um, that they were engaging in that behavior, um, whereas with problematic sexual behavior, that emotion, negative emotion tends to be stronger, um, so they're feeling guilty, so the child that did the sexual behavior um, may feel guilt um, that they did this to their sibling. Um, and the other child involved may also feel guilt, but is not going to typically have that traumatic reaction that Carrie just talked about um, that are associated with PTSD. Um, and with abusive sexual behavior, again, PTSD is not always going to be the outcome, but it's more likely to be the outcome um, with abusive sexual behavior. And then there's a question here. Um, can I hear again a differentiation between problematic sexual behavior and abusive sexual behavior, maybe with a story? Yes, okay, I can give you an example of that. So most of the children that we see in our treatment 
um, have had problematic sexual behavior. Um, so, for example, um, siblings uh, who there's an older, so I'll give it a case example. So we had um, a 10-year-old sibling who uh, got into bed with his four-year-old sister and touched her private parts. This happened on one occasion. Had that been two four-year-olds or a five and a four-year-old one time touching each other's private parts, we would probably talk with the parent about a typical, um, that that's typical sexual behavior and help them come up with a parental response that I'll talk about in just a minute. But because he was 10 years old um, and there was a six-year age difference and he was cognitively functioning at a 10-year-old level, um, that crossed the line to problematic sexual behavior. He was clearly older, he was bigger than her, but it didn't cross the line to abusive sexual behavior. An example of that would be um, we had a little girl who was 10 years old and um, was at her stepmother's home, so they lived in a blended family, and her stepsister um, was 8 years old, so they were close in age. Um, the mother, the stepmother had left the home, and they were in the care of a babysitter. The 10-year-old girl um, had decided that she wanted to touch her 8-year-old sibling's private parts. She somehow figured out a way to tie her bedroom door to the closet door so that when the babysitter tried to open it, it wouldn't open up. The 8-year-old girl was screaming for help. Um, the 10-year-old girl would not let her out of the room. And um, so that was, that was very coercive, very aggressive, and that clearly crossed the line into that more abusive sexual behavior category. Um, please let me know if that did not help to answer your question. I'm seeing there's another question. Oh, so what about siblings ages 15 and 13? Again, I think you would have to look at what the behavior was um, and what the laws in your state are. Um, in Oklahoma, uh, no child under the age of 14 can consent to any type of sexual behavior. Um, so if it was a 15 and a 13 year old in Oklahoma, that would be considered illegal sexual behavior. Um, but the things, again, that you would want to look at was the coercion, was there coercion involved, did everybody agree to do that? Usually by the time children are 13 and 15 and their siblings, they are aware that, that, that there are taboos against that, that that's not something that sh they should be engaged in. So there should be some type of intervention um, when children are that old. And please let me know if that did not answer your question. Here is a question that we are going to pull the audience about. Um, so the scenario is, and this is taken from a scenario uh, that we had um, a referral call in. So a grandmother goes upstairs to get her grandsons, who are brothers, um, to come down for dinner. When she goes, walks into the bedroom, the two boys, who were ages eight and nine, um, just had their shirts on, their pants were off, and they were taking pictures of each other's penises with their iPad. Um, grandmother separated them, and they both denied that there was any coercion or aggression um, involved in the incident and indicated um, that they were just curious. So would you classify, based on what the information that we have, would you classify the behavior as typical, problematic, or abusive? And I'll give you a few seconds here to respond. You should have some voting buttons, and you should be able to click on which one. All right, so it's excellent to see. Nope, wait, we're still getting some results in. Okay, um, so I'm glad to see that none of you classified that as abusive. Um, that is exactly right. It's definitely not abusive behavior. Um, it's very, this one is hard, and I think um, throwing in the iPad makes people a little bit more concerned and maybe go more to that problematic side. This is actually something that we would consider typical, not to say that it's okay that it happens. It certainly needs to be addressed, and we'll talk about some ways that that can be addressed here in a minute. Um, but again, looking at their ages, and given what we know, um, there's no reason to say that the eight and nine-year-olds weren't functioning at their typical cognitive levels. Um, 
so that would be considered a typical sexual behavior, and it's actually not uncommon. We're seeing lots of cases of that with um, access to iPhones, um, the uh, Nintendo DSs or DSIs that have the capability of taking pictures. Um, that is very concerning um, because of the way that information could get out, get out and used, but it is a typical sexual behavior um, in that scenario. And I'll talk in a minute about how to handle that. So this um, here is a continuum of interventions. So um, when, to help you determine, you know, once you've determined whether it's expected sexual play versus problematic mutual sexual behavior versus abusive sexual behavior, these are what's likely going to need to be included in an intervention. And again, I want to emphasize that just because um, sexual play is typical or expected does not mean that there shouldn't be a parent intervention. There absolutely should be caregiver intervention, um, just like you would intervene when children are hitting each other. Um, so th there would need to be some intervention. Um, in, with problematic and abusive sexual behavior, typically the intervention needs to be more in the realm of therapy or treatment for the family. Rarely does the family need therapy or significant treatment um, when it's just that expected sexual play. So I'm going to talk here about um, expected sexual play and interventions and how different ways that that can be handled. So I'll kind of refer back to the example with the eight and the nine-year-old grandsons who are taking pictures of each other's private parts of the iPad. So if this grandmother were to call um, you as a child advocate or us here at our center, um, what we would advise the child to do after getting a lot of information about the scenario, we'd certainly want to know whether this had happened before, but if this was the first instance of this, um, what we would advise the, the grandmother to do would be um, initially to separate the children, um, put them in different areas of the home, let them get dressed, um, and so that she would need to be able to be calm. Um, we do not want a lot of uh, negative, over-the-top reactions, yelling, screaming, physical discipline for these children. That could cause a different problem. Um, it can make the children less likely to come to her or the caregiver when there's a problem again. Um, and it also could inadvertently reinforce the sexual behavior depending on factors in the family. So we'd want the grandmother to be able to calmly provide um, information relevant to that situation. So in this situation, um, information about social rules of behavior and privacy um, would be helpful. So explaining to these boys that their private parts are for them only, um, that there are rules about private parts, and one of those rules is they can't show anybody else their private parts. Um, with the exception of maybe if they're at the doctor's office and the parent has given consent for a private part examination. Um, but in most cases, they should not be showing their private parts to other people. The second information she would want to provide is that um, in, under no circumstances should anybody be taking pictures of their private parts, and that could um, open them to be hurt or, you know, by other people or other um, ways that that information could be used for them or to, hurt, to harm them. Um, and so she would want to just provide some brief rules, some brief expectations, and then increase her supervision of the children when they're playing together and reinforce them when they're playing together appropriately and have reminders of what sexual behavior rules are. Um, she would not want to, we would not want her to have a 30-minute lecture for these children. We'd want her to keep it brief and to the point and increase her supervision to make sure that they're on the right track and, and knowing how to play with each other. Um, if it was another situation, for example, um, to a five-year-old and a four-year-old brother and sister, um, and they were looking at and touching each other's private parts because they were curious about what the differences are, then you might want to, again, get them, pull them aside, get them dressed, and have a brief family meeting about boys have penises, boys pee out of their penises, girls have um, vaginas, and there's, you know, something different, and girls sit down to pee, for example. And so just to provide some brief education about that. So you'd want to look at the situation and figure out um, what is needed in that scenario. The next um, information that we're going to focus on is more um, related to when it's 
problematic or abusive sexual behavior. Um, and we'll spend most of the time talking about problematic sexual behavior since that's where, um, if it's sexual behavior among siblings, um, it's going to fall in more that problematic or typical um, sexual behavior and how to respond to that. Um, so the first thing that should happen um, is that if it's determined that it is problematic sexual behavior, um, if an advocate or child welfare should look at the family and determine whether or not there needs to be removal of one sibling from the home. Typically it should be, if, if removal is indicated, it should be the sibling who um, initiated the problematic sexual behavior. This is rarely removal or separation of siblings is rarely needed due to the sexual behavior in and of itself, um, but it actually happens more than rarely. So some things to consider about when to de determine if removal needs to happen is the reaction of the siblings. Um, so say um, the victim, so in that example that I gave with the 10-year-old girl and her 8-year-old step-sibling when she tied um, the door closed, the reaction of that the eight-year-old girl, she was very fearful of her siblings. She was very scared. She had a lot of reactions. In that case, there needed to be some removal so that the family could stabilize and the girl could be, both girls could be treated um, before there was talk of reunification. But if the little girl, you know, um, in the case where it was more problematic, say the four-year-old and the 10-year-old that I spoke of earlier where he touched her private parts on one occasion, um, there was an intervention in the home, and the little four-year-old girl really kind of went about her daily business. She was not scared of the 10-year-old. She was handling the situation very well. Um, so in that case, just looking at that alone, there did not need to be removal. The biggest factor is the caregiver's ability to supervise. So um, do they recognize that there has been problematic or abusive sexual behavior, and are they going to increase their supervision so that the vulnerable children in the home are protected um, and the other, the child who initiated the sexual behavior is supervised at all times. Um, and what has been the response of the child who initiated the sexual behavior's um, response to parental intervention? So if they are now aware that this is a problem and they are um, focusing on keeping the sexual behavior rules and having appropriate interactions with others, that's a good response. Whereas, for example, a bad response may be continuing to try to attempt to get the younger child alone all the time. Um, they're not having a very good response to parental intervention, and you should consider removal at that point. Other things to consider, and these um, should absolutely be considered are other risk factors in the home. So substance abuse, um, other sexual abuse in the home by adults or physical abuse or neglect in adults um, would seriously um, compromise their ability to be able to appropriately supervise the children. Um, the second thing sh that should be done is to establish a, a sh establish a supervision plan with the caregivers and with the families. And we'll have a few slides here in a minute about what a good safety, standard safety plan. This can be um, established at first contact with a child advocate um, and can be addressed as needed in therapy as well. So we'll talk in a minute about what a good supervision plan is. Um, the second step would be determining if there needs to be some treatment. So certainly if their child has engaged in problematic or abusive sexual behavior, um, that child needs to be in some type of treatment. And we'll talk about what that treatment should look like in a minute. Um, the other issues to consider too would be have is a child who initiated this problematic sexual behavior is what type of treatment they'll need, and I'll talk about more of that in a minute. The other thing that you want to look at is who needs to be involved in treatment. So certainly the child who initiated the sexual behavior problems, but absolutely the caregivers, whoever is going to be responsible for supervising that child, um, needs to be involved in treatment. And then other siblings, and so not just um, the sibling who was involved in the sexual behavior um, or the victim of the sexual behavior, but other siblings as a whole too, and I'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, so what we know about characteristics of effective treatment for the child who has initiated problematic sexual behavior. Um, 
are um, based on some meta-analysis results um, that were conducted um, in our center as well as some others in conjunction with some other centers around the country. So we know that it can be relative outpatient, um, rarely is inpatient or residential tra treatment needed, um, and it's relatively short term, so 12, or I'm sorry, three months to six months. Um, there can be very effective treatment such that um, children who are involved in that treatment don't look any different um, from children who have never had a sexual behavior problem. What we know is the biggest um, characteristic or the biggest component that's going to have the best results is behavioral parent training or teaching parents behavior management skills. So one example of that Carrie spoke about earlier was PCIT or parent-child interaction therapy. So teaching them some how to implement rules, not only about their sexual behavior, but just how to um, establish rules in the home for general behavior problems, focusing on positive discipline and appropriate behavior management. When that occurred with teaching the family rules about sexual behavior, uh, how to talk about developmentally appropriate sex education, and providing abuse prevention skills to both the caregivers and the children, those had the best results um, and most impact on the family of children with problematic sexual behavior treatments. Um, these treatments are cognitive behavioral in nature. Um, TFCBT, or trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, um, is also found to be effective in treating children with problematic sexual behavior when there is also a trauma involved um, for the child who has initiated the problematic sexual behavior. Um, what we did find, though, was that elements of, of treatment for adult sexual offenders, the so elements that evolved from that type of treatment, such as rearousal, um, reconditioning, talking about their cycles of abuse, were not effective at all in treating children with problematic sexual behaviors. Again, um, probably the most crucial aspect of that is getting the caregivers involved in treatment. Um, so again, teaching them uh, behavioral parent training to address sexual behavior, but also other behavior problems. Having a good safety and supervision plan in place, um, providing with them with support, because when you see the safety and supervision plan, um, it is a very uh, difficult thing to manage for some parents, um, and so having the appropriate support to be able to provide that safety and supervision, um, helping caregivers understand the sexual development of children across the lifespan, um, and then how to reinforce appropriate boundaries, modesty um, in the home, if not just the child with sexual behavior problems, but all members of the home. Um, and I talked about behavior management. Um, we'll talk in a minute here about what are some good sexual behavior rules. Abuse prevention skills is crucial not only for the siblings, um, but also for the child who initiated sexual behavior. Um, sometimes adult perpetrators will look for those types of characteristics, and so um, they are at higher risk for being abused themselves. Another aspect to consider is the caregiver's emotional um, reaction or behavioral reaction to the problematic sexual behaviors. It can be very difficult um, for some caregivers to be supportive of the child who has initiated the sexual behavior. Oftentimes that brings in changes to the family, but brings in other um, agencies into the family like child welfare or um, law enforcement and those kinds of things, and there can be a very strong emotional reaction to that. Um, the other thing that I mentioned earlier was how to talk to your child about uh, sexuality and sexual development um, across the ages. Uh, and then we have a question, in the meta-analysis of effective treatment, what was the age range of the children with problematic sexual behavior? And those included preschool and school-age children, so children up to age 12. Thank you. All right, the next step would be um, having some family sessions. So again, you would want to have a family session where you're going to review that safety plan with everybody to make sure that everybody is clear about what the safety plan is and who to go to um, when there's been a problem with the safety plan, how to establish clear and appropriate boundaries. So for example, you know, one person in the bathroom at a time with the door shut. Um, and how to establish privacy rules in the home. 
you would want to have some family sessions um, to address that. In your family sessions, you would also want to focus on what things um, the siblings can do each to do with each other. How can they go on to have a healthy sibling relationship? So you also want to focus on what are the good qualities, what are the good things that they can do with each other. Um, and then finally, as the child with problematic sexual behavior demonstrates that they're learning the rules, that they're following the rules um, about appropriate sexual behavior, you certainly want to make sure that they have opportunities to develop same-age peer relationships, um, to keep up their social skills, and being involved in, in same-age peer activities. At first, that would start off with very close supervision by adults. Um, until they, they had demonstrated that they were able to resort back to um, typical levels of supervision. And then the therapist um, involved in the family would continue to follow up and make sure um, that the family was um, doing well before they were discharged from treatment. Um, similar, we're going to talk, a, we're going to switch a little bit to the more abusive sexual behavior, and it's very similar to um, protocols for kids with um, problematic sexual behavior, but there are some differences. Kids who have, uh, children who have more abusive sexual behavior may um, more likely be required to have separation. Remember here that some, most kids can come back into the home with um, the sibling, their sibling victim. Um, they may require short-term separation. Some may require longer separation than others. But remember that um, removal doesn't mean removal forever. And it's always preferable, if possible, to remove the child with the abusive sexual behavior. Um, it's just it provides more support and stability for the kid. Um, who was victimized, and they also think don't want them to feel like they're punished for telling. So it is always preferable for the kid with abusive sexual behavior. And if you do have to remove a kid from the home, also try and find the least restrictive environment that meets safety and treatment needs. If a kid is removed from the home, that doesn't mean they need to go to a residential or inpatient facility. What that means is maybe they can live with grandma or maybe they can live with aunt or short term they may have to go to a foster home. But most kids um, can be treated in the community. So while a separation may be required, inpatient or residential um, treatment is often not required um, for most kids. Factors to kind of consider for removal and placement decisions recognition of the problematic behavior. Do the parents recognize this is a problem behavior and are they supportive of both kids, or all kids, I should say, there's not just always two. The kid who has the problematic sexual behavior as well as the kids, um, the sibling victims in the home. Um, are there, um, what is their responsiveness to parental intervention? Are they willing to provide supervision? Do they understand what supervision means? Or are they frequently making excuses? Well, my house has too many rooms in it. How do you expect me to supervise? Um, or are they willing to problem solve? We have two bedrooms and I have four kids and I sleep in one bedroom and my kids sleep in the other. Can you help me figure out how to um, configure my um, sleeping arrangement so that all my kids are safe. If they're willing to try and problem solve, then I think that's good. they're more likely to be um, receptive to interventions. Um, their reaction to the siblings. Are they supportive of, the sibling, of all siblings, or do they say, well, she walks around in her underwear, what do you expect? That, if they say that, then the parents probably aren't ready to have both kids in the home. Um, their supervision capacity. Some parents try as they might, maybe cognitively can't provide adequate supervision. So just kind of being aware of can the parents provide that and um, do they have the support they need to provide proper supervision. The degree of safety in the home. I just kind of mentioned um, some, some families have very small homes and, or they have one bathroom. And how do you regulate bathroom time and bedroom time? Um, uh, do they live in a home where uh, adults, whether it's domestic violence or, or substance abuse, that may also inhibit them from providing a safe home um, or adequate supervision. The risk to the community, is this kid, is it a one-time or two or three-time thing, that, uh, or is it something that's continuous even though the parents have tried to adequately intervene? What are the effects of the removal and what placement options do you have? Or is there an option for the kid if you have to remove them from the home? 
You want to make sure, again, that you're providing adequate treatment for the family. So when it's abusive sexual behavior, it is absolutely, you, they need to be in um, treatment for sexual behavior problems specific. They also may have other treatment concerns. They may have co-occurring disorders such as ADHD. They may have, be depressed because they feel really bad about what they did, so they may be suffering depression. Um, they may have other types of, they may have their own trauma that they're dealing with. So in addition to um, problematic sexual behavior, they may have to have uh, some sort of trauma treatment, and then they may actually need trauma treatment before they go into um, problematic sexual behavior treatment. So just kind of being aware of what they need. Do they need inpatient or uh, residential placement? Few kids do, but some some do need that. Caregiver involvement. Which caregiver is going to be involved? It should be the caregiver that provides supervision and that's responsible for supervision of that child most of the time. Um, what's the impact of placement decisions? So will the caregiver be able to be involved if they're placed, um, if they're removed from the home? And then also always remember possible treatment for the non-offending sibling, siblings, just making sure they get screened adequately. Do they need treatment or not? Um, when we're talking about residential or inpatient treatment, um, we need to screen for how aggressive and intrusive was the sexual behavior. Does it continue to reoccur despite adequate treatment and close supervision? Parents are compliant and it continues to happen. We've had a kid before that the parents were in treatment and they followed all the guidelines, yet this kid would sit at the dinner table and masturbate in at the dinner table and they would say, stop what you're doing and go to your room and he would just continue to masturbate. That's a kid that's gonna need residential or inpatient treatment versus the kid who did it the parents say, these are our rules. You have to go to the bathroom and take your pajamas with you and dress in the bathroom. Don't come out without clothes. Those parents and the kids who are able to follow those commands can most of the time remain in the home um, with proper supervision, et cetera. When a kid's actively suicidal or actively homicidal, those kids are going to need residential treatment or inpatient. When the kid, like I discussed the kid at the dinner table, when they have severe behavioral or emotional problems, they're unable to function in the community, even in school, specialized school settings, those kids may require inpatient treatment. Um, so talking about to your parents about what that might look like. When the child has um, symptoms that are so severe um, that they require, that they don't respond to adequate medication. There are some kids who do require medication, and so, but they're not responding to it. Also be aware that kids who have suffered, that have more severe trauma history or more severe co-occurring um, problems, those kids may require a higher level of care. That's, but also remember that this level of care should, um, should be reserved for um, the kids who really need it. Um, we often over-utilize over um, placements, residential placements, and so then when kids who really need that they'll have problems um, finding space for them, and it's really expensive. Um, so reasons for residential, it's a controlled environment. They have daily treatment contacts. They have um, more caretakers available. They have higher levels um, of community protection, and there's safety of the child that you need to consider, the, the non-offending kid as well as the child with problematic sexual behavior. They're more protected. Um, in some cases. The concerns are it's really hard and difficult for caregivers to be involved. Um, sometimes kids are even sent out of state to residential placements and it's really hard, particularly for families with limited resources, to be involved in treatment. Their exposure to other children with more severe behavior problems than they have, they could learn how to have more severe problems disruption of social attachments. There's also a labeling or stigma. Where have you been for six months? Where have you been for two years? People are gonna know. Um, they have a higher potential for victimization when you're placed in a residential facility. It's also very, very costly and it's um, a use of our resources um, that could maybe be better use for lower levels of care. Big important thing, again, like Lisa stated, this is very similar to problematic sexual behavior. They need to educate parents about what's appropriate and inappropriate, not just legal and illegal, but what's appropriate. 
warning behaviors, watching pornography um, or masturbating to while they're neglecting other behaviors, that's a warning sign that they're starting to have excessive um, sexual behavior. Um, they need to discuss sex education. They need group support because um, these parents oftentimes don't have the support they need establish appropriate supervision for the youth, and they also need help in determining appropriateness for reunification. So we talked about most kids can go back in the home, but parents are going to need a lot of guidance and support for this. So um, how do they determine if siblings are ready for the, their their youth to come back into the home? And, who, and you also want to make sure, this is really important, make sure reunification happens while the family's still in treatment. Um, for the problematic sexual behavior. So I'm going to talk a, a little bit about visitation and reunification decisions. So typically these decisions are made by the agencies that are involved uh, with the family. So child welfare, uh, probation, if the uh, courts are involved, the judge um, could help to determine these decisions. Um, as well as the therapists and the caregivers that are involved in treatment. Um, let's see, I'm getting a question. Do you feel if a person has married a person that has been convicted for sexual abuse, should they be around the other party's children? I think that's a very difficult question to answer um, because uh, some people who have been convicted um, of sexual offenses may be, depending on the laws of the state and where they were convicted, it may be for something um, that was more like indecent exposure, say when they urinated in public um, and, you know, were caught doing that and now they've been convicted of a sexual offense. Um, other times, clearly, they have had a history um, of abusing, sexually abusing children or vulnerable adults or other people um, and you know, that certainly is much riskier and concerning. So I, I think that's a very difficult question to answer, and I think that you would need to know um, the history and, and get records of um, what the sexual offense included, um, if, if there were records of treatment, um, and the age of the, child, of the person that was convicted also matters. So if it was somebody who was, say, convicted at age 14, um, and they've had appropriate treatment and then they've gone 20 or 30 years without having problematic sexual behavior, I think that's a different case than uh, somebody who uh, was convicted as an adult and um, where we know that treatment is less, less, less effective for adult uh, sexual offenders. Um, so I'm sorry, I don't have a great answer for that question. Um, so now I want to switch to talking about visitation and reunification decisions. So when there's problematic but not abusive sexual behavior, um, like we said earlier, children are often removed, uh, or the siblings uh, who have the problematic sexual behavior are often removed to assess um, the, the functioning of the other child involved and what's the safety risk. But unfortunately what happens is that sometimes then visitation or reunification um, gets delayed for a variety of reasons, just the courts are slow. Um, maybe parent had a minor infraction or had difficulty obtaining treatment and things get delayed. So the following information is more based on when there's been clear abusive sexual behavior um, and the child with problematic sexual behavior has been removed from the home. Um, so what you would want to look at um, for the sibling victim or victims is, is that sibling interested in contact? Um, so, for example, we have a, a young sibling right now, actually she's not so young, she's about 10 years old, and she's saying, I just want things to be back to normal. Her brother, who's an adolescent, has been out of the home for two years. She really wants him back into home, and she wants things back to normal. Um, so that's somebody who's expressing that they're interested in contact. Um, another thing that you want to look at is, is the sibling victim, what her, his, or her report is, is that matching the um, police report, the uh, child welfare report, and the sibling with problematic sexual behaviors report of what happened. So there shouldn't be very many discrepancies in the reports of what happened. If um, the sibling victim did have to go to treatment, if it, they had an assessment and treatment was indicated, 
Um, how are they progressing in treatment? Are they still, does, have their abuse-related symptoms um, reduced? Are they clear about whose responsibility it is, the other sibling? And have they been able to discuss their thoughts and feelings with the parent? For the child or for the sibling with problematic sexual behavior, you're looking at similar things. So are they able to discuss their problematic sexual behavior? Are they making progress in treatment? Have they um, accepted that they have been responsible for this problematic sexual behaviors? And are they demonstrating that they're following the sexual behavior rules and have a developmentally appropriate understanding of the harm caused to others based on their behavior? For the caregivers, again, this is very important to make sure that caregivers are clear about whose responsibility is and putting that um, responsibility where it, where it belongs. Um, do they know the details about the abuse, um, what led up to it, and what are potential risky situations so that they can prevent those from occurring? Are they supportive of both children and both of, or all of the siblings involved? Um, and have they been adequately following a supervision plan? Um, typically, how this visitation and reunification process would go would be that depending on the age of the child who initiated the sexual behavior and their developmental abilities, they would write a letter um, of apology to the family, to their sibling for engaging in sexual behavior. Then there would be a family session. Um, they, that letter would be read by a therapist. It would be reviewed with that child's therapist. And then they would have family sessions. Um, where the sibling um, who initiated the sexual behavior would read that to their um, younger sibling or siblings and the family members. Um, a safety plan, which we'll go over in just a minute, will be discussed with all family members. Uh, modifications will be made to that, um, and, and everybody will uh, sign that safety plan. Depending on how long it has been since the children have seen each other, you may want to have a few sessions, or the therapist may want to have a few sessions um, where the siblings are just practicing interacting together. Um, so in that case that I talked about, those siblings haven't seen each other for two years. It's going to be pretty uncomfortable for both of them the first time that they meet. So we would want to have a few sessions with them where we have some activity, a puzzle that they put together, um, a game that they play under supervision, um, where they're just learning how to be siblings again. So then after, you know, but some kids may not need that if they've seen each other regularly. It may just be starting with an outing, so going um, out to eat and under the watchful eye of the caregivers, um, and then progressing to longer home visits, um, then to longer home visits where there's an overnight visit, and monitoring everybody's reaction, and then making a plan for returning home. So it's a gradual, um, but it also depends on how much contact they've had and how the contact is going once they've started to have contact with each other. So here are some visitation rules and supervision rules um, that should uh, be upheld uh, for the families who have had problematic sibling sexual behavior. So the child who uh, initiated the problematic sexual behavior should not be alone at any time um, with any child who's under the age of 12 or who's a more vulnerable child or person. Um, when they're going to be with that person, they need to be under the watchful eye of an adult who knows the history and can make sure to be there to monitor their interactions. They should not be in charge of any child, um, be it the sibling that they have the sexual behavior problem with or other children, um, for any type of activity. So not babysitting. They sh the parent shouldn't say, you watch your younger brother while I go cook dinner um, or I run to the store, anything like that. They should not be in charge. They should not be giving the responsibility to discipline or correct other children in the home. And um, we should establish what the household rules are, making sure that all children are following those, and being respectful in the way that they talk and um, interact with other children. And then I have a question. Do you feel that periodic therapy or counseling sessions following the return of the problematic sibling is necessary years following to ensure the sibling is not con encountering continued behavioral problems or confusion on appropriate behavior. N not sure I quite understand the question, but typically um, when the child with problematic sexual behavior and their caregiver has gone through treatment and com successfully completed treatment, when reunification has happened, um, when they are in treatment and things are going well, what we will do is discharge the patient. It usually does not require years of therapy. Usually um, with school-aged children, 
it's about four to six months. With our adolescents, it could be about a year. Um, and as, as long as the sibling is not um, having any significant emotional or behavioral problems, um, you know, they would be discharged successfully without continued therapeutic intervention. What we would do, though, is talk with the caregivers about signs, symptoms, things to be aware of, about when they should seek treatment again. Please let me know if that did not answer your question. And Carrie is going to talk about a safety plan. So we um, talked about a safety plan, and I... Um, we talked to... Um, one of the things is children are not allowed... the sibling with problematic sexual behavior are not allowed in the other children's um, um, rooms, and so that's really important. And if the child comes in, the, the there's a couple of questions I'll get to, though, in just one second. Um, I want to tie these two things together. So if a uh, child with a problematic sexual behavior has their own room and one of their siblings comes into the room, the child with problematic sexual behavior has to leave the room and go tell an adult to deal with it. They cannot stay in the room and tell the child to get out because that would mean they would have authority over them. So um, just making sure and explaining that to children uh, or to the families and to, the, to everybody involved how that works. Um, we have a question of how would you deal with the lack of parent caregivers' lack of participation in tr treatment? We um, have oftentimes have parents who, for one reason or another, may not be as involved in treatment as we like. Um, one of the things clearly that you could do that um, is to talk to the caregivers about this is really important that you follow the safety plans or attend treatment um, because your other kids or others in the community may be at risk. Um, and so you really need to attend these sessions in order to complete treatment. And one, hopefully, if their child's out of the home, to get their child back in the home. Or two, if the child's children remain in the home, you may have to report um, if that um, child, uh, if they're not following treatment. Um, it's just always assumed and uh, the best way to handle parents who say, well, it's his problem he needs to be treated, I don't have anything to do with it, is it's not for the parents to understand um, exactly what happened. That's why we have the kid here. But the parent has to be there to support the child, and they can't have treatment there unless they participate in the treatment. Um, because these kids, the parents are highly involved at home in the treatment and supervision. I hope that helps. I was trying to go really fast because we're running out of time, so I apologize for the quick explanation. Um, make sure that the kid with problematic sexual behavior is never, um, when the, they don't, they're not involved in bathing, of hygiene of the younger children, um, and that they're fully clothed. I'm just going to mention one thing about um, the no horseplay, wrestling, and tickling. A lot of parents are resistive of that rule because they're like, well, that's just normal play. Why can't they? Because someone accidentally, when kids tickle or wiggle around, hands move, bodies move, and they could accidentally touch someone's private part. Um, another question is what can a parent do when their child with problematic sexual behavior does not have access to appropriate treatment? Um, there is, there's going to be a slide. It's going to be the resource slide at the very end. Um, it's the... Um, Association for the Treatment of Sexual Abusers. There is a page at the very end of this presentation um, that I know uh, Logan is going to send to everybody, and it talks about how to get a list of treatment providers in a community. So hopefully a parent can have access to that appropriate treatment. Um, but there's going to be a website where to go to get a list of providers in your area. Um, I do you have um, a question, a response question? Um, so what are plan, safety plan barriers? And this was supposed to be labeled A, B, C, D, and S, but, or, or D and E, but Lisa and I were not, we had some technological difficulties, and so just know that number one is A, et cetera. If you could vote quickly.
Okay. All right. In, uh, just because we're kind of running out of time, I'm going to go ahead and skip to the results. Um, sorry for that quickness. And it looks like most of you were right on anyway because it's all of the above. Um, single parents, lack of respite care, multiple children, house size, uh, parental attitude are often all barriers for the safety plan. Um, I have another question. Oh, that was one I already answered, sorry. I got distracted by the multiple things in the chat room. Um, Lisa talked about this um, earlier when you were talking about reunification, but you want to make sure that the caregivers um, are involved in the development of the safety plan develop a list of problematic activities so such as using the internet without supervision that might be a prop that might be something that would be a list of on the list of problematic activities um, make sure you develop a list of what's okay to do with your siblings so you can't wrestle and tickle but what can you do with your siblings you can play board games you can watch a movie with adult supervision um, you could play basketball outside so there are lots of things and make sure there's a joint prevention plan um, in place. And the siblings can be involved in this um, development of the safety plan too. They can say, well, what do you think would be good to do with your brother if he comes home? What activities would you like to do together? And um, so that gets a buy-in from all family members. Um, you want to make sure that uh, everybody is involved in that. In some cases, an apology letter may be read. It's not required, but it may be um, something that the family partakes in. It just needs to make sure that it is with their therapist and not on their own um, in case there are questions or concerns. You're going to discuss the sexual behavior rules, which are on the next couple of slides. Talk about modesty and privacy in the home. Everybody in the home has to follow this. The siblings, um, that may have been the victim, the sibling with problematic sexual behavior, and the caretakers all need to be have modesty and cannot walk around without their clothes on. Again, a list of activities children can do and uh, plan your first visit activities if they haven't been visiting in a while. Here's the sexual behavior rules, um, and you'll get a copy of these when Logan sends this out, so I'm going to, in time's interest, I'm going to skip these next two. but. The private part rules are different because they're for preschoolers, and so they're um, a little bit shorter in length. Again, contraindications to reunification are denial by the um, by the uh, sibling with sexual behavior problems or the parents when abuse has clearly occurred. Again, if the parent's saying, well, she shouldn't have walked around naked and it wouldn't have happened, that's a contraindication. If they've been in treatment and the parents still say that, that's a huge red flag. Significant negative responses by the sibling victims or the siblings, um, siblings pressure to reunify. If you just let him come home, then we can all be a family again. If you let him come home, I'll buy you a, that video game you want. Cases of severe, severe abuse, maybe those shouldn't be reunified. Recent history of severe violence by the um, sibling with problematic sexual behavior and significant unresolved um, abuser or uh, parental issues. So if there's significant domestic violence in the home, that may be a problem or significant substance abuse because they would, couldn't provide adequate supervision. Um, the next few slides, we are done, but the next few slides are really just um, resource slides that we wanted you to have so that as, um, when you um, go go and take this information that you have plenty of resources. So um, this is um, for treatment requests. You can go to this website right here and um, you can request a um, the bottom website and request a list of uh, providers in your area. Um, this site is under development but should be complete this summer, the NCSBY, and it will have resources for professionals, caregivers, and children. Um, the NCTSN, it's the Trauma Network, a special issue journal about children with sexual behavior problems. Stop It Now has great resources for victims and for problematic um, sexual behaviors books that are about five dollars that might be good um, we give those to our families oftentimes and um, thank you very much for having us um,
Um, and we appreciated everything. And I see one final question about can we get the slideshow. Um, Logan is going to email you uh, the slides and all the PowerPoint. Yeah, so we've gotten a lot of questions about this. Um, the confirmation email will come from ReadyTalk. And on the right side of that email, you will see um, the files available for download that will include this PowerPoint as well as several handouts that you can, um, you know, use for your own educational purposes as well as um, provide them to parents that you are working with. So keep your eye out for that email. It will be in your inbox shortly. And it looks like... No other questions. So um, thank you so much, Lisa and Carrie, and thank all of you, thanks to all of you for being um, on the call today. And we look forward to um, working with you in the future. Thank you. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Please stand by.